um, Ray, Ray Brown's Talking Birds show about a little bit about Prairie Rapids Audubon and themselves as ambassadors and Iowa Bird Friendly. A little short, about 10 minutes into the half hour program. It's a good uh, weekly show. And there's a link to that on our website as well. Uh, Denver's now the uh, bird friendly community. And we are, want to remind you, it's not too late to uh, um, contribute to the Birdathon or make a con contribution this year. Uh, this money will be, well, we're in good shape for our regular expenses. But what we raise from now on out will help us with our projects and grants and things that we offer to our six counties in the region. Um, and you can contribute. We'll have our contributors listed in the newsletter. And if you don't want to have your name listed, you sure can do that as an anonymous donor. Um, so I'm going to turn this over next to uh, uh, Candace, who will mention about if you have a question or a speaker or any comments, you can click on the chat version, the chat button, and she will be monitoring that. So I'm going to unmute myself and we'll let Candace speak about that. And then I'll get back on to introduce our speaker and to see what you've been seeing around the area lately. Okay, very good. Again, thanks for joining us, everyone. It's great to see everyone. And um, for those of you who are, you know, have done a lot of Zooming, you know where to find the chat buttons. You have to take your cursor down towards the bottom of the screen and kind of hover and you'll have a menu bar and there'll be a little option that says chat. If you click on that, you'll get a little um, square. And if it's in the middle of the screen, you can click on it and drag it to the side. Um, and you can type in messages there. And um, I'm gonna try and relate your questions to um, Mr. Hart. And um, so, but yeah, if you've got a question or a thought, just, um, just give us a chat. Thank you, Candace. Mm -hmm. So as a reminder, next month, we'll be also be doing a Zoom meeting with Anna Buckhart Thomas, our new avian biologist for DNR. She has an excellent program on, on um, telling birds and bird research that she'll be sharing with us. And uh, right now, our, the church where we normally meet is closed to the public until further notice. So we have no plans at this point to uh, be meeting as a group other than on Zoom um, until at least January, and then we'll reassess from there, unless we hear something different from the church. But right now it's even close to their, their members. But uh, things work out, so maybe in the future we'll be able to do both things. Well, they have a recorded version you can look at later, um, and an in-person, always fun social event with uh, a lot of our friends gathered for good treats and good programs. So. We were really excited to have uh, uh, Doug Haar as our first speaker for uh, um, our Audubon this year. Doug's no stranger to us. He's presented to us before and in the past. He has done decades of uh, service to Iowa, um, not only as a birder, but as a, with his work with the DNR and the uh, non-game division, where he's been important, but um, uh, uh, important, important leader. Um, now he's uh, currently president of uh, Iowa Audubon <clears throat> and he does a fantastic job statewide representing Audubon interests and birds. And he's also one of the founding members of Bird Friendly um, Iowa and is on the steering committee as a representative of that. We sure thank him for all the work that he's done with, with this. I got to, some of us got to see Doug's program uh, it was last winter, I think, I maybe, Doug, it was um, at Iowa Prairie Network, I think, meeting, and it was on grassland birds and prairie habitats, and it was just excellent. Uh, it really wrapped up things well about what you can find in, in grasslands and the birds that are there. It gets you to be inspired to want to go into grasslands and see what you can see, especially in the next, maybe the next month or so in October when some of our 
sparrows and other things start arriving. Um, I know some of you have been seeing the change over in the last couple of days with uh, white migrants coming through. Uh, I had a morning warbler in my backyard this morning, first time ever, and went out birding for a little bit. And I know Doug's been birding around his area too. And he has an interesting little video he's gonna show us of some uh, a bird we saw out west. That was re it's really fun to watch. So I think you're probably heard enough from me for sure for right now. I'll join you again at the very end of the meeting. And right now I would just want to welcome um, uh, with a great amount of respect and admiration to Doug Har uh, with his program. Doug, take it away. Hey, uh, thanks Tom and uh, thanks uh, for inviting me here to the meeting tonight. Um, really uh, fun to try this. I've been at a number of Zoom meetings for different organizations in the last couple of months, but uh, this is the first time I've ever tried to give a PowerPoint program on a Zoom meeting. So uh, we actually, uh, Tom and, and uh, Candace and Francis, a couple of others, uh, we all practiced this a little bit the other morning to make sure this was going to work. Uh, I'm also going to be giving this program to the Iowa City Bird Club later this month. So it was really a, a good chance to get to make sure that I, I knew exactly how this was going to work. And I will just uh, add a little bit to what Tom said about why I put this program together. Um, actually, it was last, I think about November, October, November, I was asked by the Iowa Prairie Network if I could give a program about prairie birds at the uh, Iowa Prairie Network's winter seminar uh, that they have every year at Ames. And uh, I did ask them why they wanted something on birds because that's a prairie plant organization, oriented organization. They said, well, our people know a lot about plants. We'd like to know a lot more about the birds and what kind of plants and prairies they like. So I put together this program and Tom was there. He saw it and, and whether it was right then or uh, shortly after, sometime after the meeting, he uh, asked if I would be, uh, po could possibly give this program uh, for Prairie Rapids Audubon. And I, I said, sure. And uh, Karen Dispro from Iowa City Bird Club also had heard that I gave the program and wanted, to, <laughs> wanted her club to see it too. So I guess uh, this is something I hadn't really expected, but I guess it's gonna be a, a standard production on behalf of Iowa Audubon now. And I may, who knows where all, all I'm gonna be giving that. So I think I'm gonna go ahead and start with this. When we get done, we will let uh, let you ask any questions, and and Candace can have can handle that um, through well whatever the method that is. How they have to text you a message somehow, and and then you ask the question, I guess, and I try to answer it. And then when we're done with that, Tom had mentioned this. It's just a short video that I took out in South Dakota about two weeks ago when I was out on a birding trip out there and it was kind of an interesting thing that I've never taken any good pictures of or a video before of this particular bird. So we can do that, but that's just a real short thing at the end. So I'll go ahead and I'm gonna go down to uh, share screen here. And, uh, and for some reason it says, the host has disabled participant screen sharing. <laughs> So Francis, I assume you have to turn something on. Oh, now it's come up, okay. I found the button. Okay, <laughs> we're up. And we will start from the beginning of this. And this is, um, as I said, it, it's a presentation I'm doing on behalf of Iowa Audubon. Uh, I've done a number of programs, put together a number of programs for the Iowa Audubon Society over the past several years. Uh, I have traveled around the state giving a lot of programs. I think I've given two for Prairie Rapids Audubon uh, a few years back, if I recall. It's been a while, but uh, it's really nice to be back here and do it again. Uh, and these are, um, one of the reasons that uh, Tom said that he's going to put this online so that uh, anybody who's here, not here tonight, can view this if they want. Uh, I do these on behalf of Iowa Audubon, and they're, they're there to be shared with anybody who wants to use them, show them whenever they can. So uh, feel free to view this or pass it on to whoever you'd like. Um, so the name of this program is... Um, 
saving prairies can save grassland birds. And I assume you can probably hear the particular call uh, of this bird that's pictured here, Western Meadowlark. And um, then we're going to start just by talking a little bit about some things that people might be most familiar with as far as grassland birds. And again, this program was put together on behalf of a, of a prairie uh, organization, you know, a, an organization that preserves and restores prairies. And they wanted to little, learn a little bit more about birds. So we're going to show you a few typical birds and then some things that a lot of those uh, prairie people may not be real familiar with. I kind of assume a lot of people from Prairie Rapids Audubon will be very familiar with the birds, but hopefully you might learn a little bit more about the prairies that these particular birds like to use. Of course, one of the most familiar things that you'll always see in grasslands of any kind is a ringneck pheasant, a bird which isn't native to Iowa. It was introduced to uh, the United States in 1888 from China, and it came to I Iowa in the early 1900s. And uh, now it is widespread across the state. And actually, there's quite a growing population of them again this year. So that's pretty good news. <clears throat> Another bird that is very common in our grasslands, whether it's pastures or roadside ditches or prairies, uh, that a lot of birders are familiar with, but probably not very many uh, prairie plant specialists may really be familiar with, is this little bird uh, called the Vesper Sparrow. Um, it is a bird that's in decline, primarily because, well, a loss of grasslands in the Midwest, of course, but also because of a loss of a lot of their grasslands where they spend the winter in northern Mexico, in the Chihuahua, uh, in Chihuahua area in northern Mexico. Uh, but we'll talk about Vesper Sparrow a little bit later. And just in case you didn't know, Vesper Sparrow gets its name because it really likes to sing its song during the breeding season, especially just before sunset at night, or like a Vesper at a church service. So that's where it got its original name. Now, our native prairies and even uh, other kinds of mixed grasslands can uh, really make very uh, important, critically needed habitat for a lot of species of birds in Iowa. At least 30, perhaps as many as 35 species of grassland birds really depend on having native prairie or some sort of especially mixed grasslands, even if they're tame, mixed grasslands and hay fields uh, providing a lot more habitat than uh, just crop fields and pastures. And of course, the real problem here in Iowa, as everybody's familiar with, uh, we have the most human changed landscape of any state in the United States. And so we can only host a very small variety of birds in a lot of our uh, very expansive row crop areas. Generally one to five species is about all that can be found in an area of large row crops, even if it has a few roadside ditches or, or little waterways or something. There just is not enough mixed habitat for them. And I'm sure a lot of you are aware, um, especially birders are aware of this, that last fall, I think it was about September or October, uh, the science uh, publication uh, had assembled uh, a bunch of research from a lot of different agencies and uh, universities over the period of the last 50 years to try to determine exactly what was happening to our bird population. And it was uh, published when it came out on the media and the newspapers and on TV and radio and everywhere. I think it really shocked a lot of people to find out that North America's bird population has declined by almost 30% uh, since 1970. So we're seeing almost a third fewer birds than we did 50 years ago. Uh, and this chart that was put together by the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology kind of shows where the biggest declines are. Eastern forest birds are down about 17%, tundra birds down 23, western birds, forest birds down 29, boreal forest birds from up north, Minnesota and Canada down 33%, shorebirds uh, down 37%, and I'm sure a lot of birders realize they're just not seeing the numbers of shorebirds we used to here in Iowa or anywhere. But here's the big shocker, and that is that grassland birds in North America have declined by 53%. So there's more than half less birds, uh, grassland birds in North America today than there was in 1970. <clears throat> and that's a loss of 720 million grassland birds in that period of time. And uh, one of the uh, 
species that is in pretty severe decline, although we do see a fair number of them in Iowa, we don't see as many as we used to, is the eastern meadowlark, which is, uh, has lost three out of four, uh, or about 75% of its population in North America since 1970. Uh, the western meadowlark is also going down, although not quite as bad because it tends to be in more western states where there's more uh, grassland still existing. And I put together this little graph uh, uh, a few years ago for a, another program and I've shifted a little bit because there's a little bit of change, but you can kind of see from this exactly what the uh, status of Iowa's birds are based on their habitat. And if you look at forest birds, our forest birds are doing a little bit better in the last couple of decades because Iowa's forests, a lot of forests were replanted, uh, a lot were allowed to m mature properly, uh, forestry was cut, or uh, uh, commercial forestry had been reduced a bit. And so forest birds have been doing a little bit better in Iowa. Uh, wetland birds have increased in numbers. Uh, Probably 20 years ago, this yellow arrow would have been only in the middle of that orange portion of the graph, but they are increasing in Iowa because so many wetlands are being restored by state, county, and federal agencies, and even uh, on private land through the NRCS and other programs. But again, grassland birds have just not increased at all. Uh, they are, um, because of the habitat, they're in very uh, serious condition here in Iowa. So let's talk a little bit about what types of prairie habitats do some of our different grassland birds prefer. And we're gonna look at a whole bunch of different types of prairie. We're gonna start out with short grass prairie, which really is not very well known here in Iowa. Uh, very, uh, only small specks of it, uh, mostly in the western part of the state, maybe a little bit in the tops of the Lus Hills and some other places. This particular photo I took out at Pawnee Prairie, National Grasslands in uh, um, Colorado, in northeastern Colorado, back in 2016 when I was out trying to get some bird photos out there. Uh, but we have little tiny patches of short grass prairie in Iowa as well. As I mentioned, the tops of some of the Lus Hills will have some real short grass prairies. And this is uh, one of the areas that I used to manage as a wildlife manager for Iowa DNR up in Dickinson County. This is called the uh, Grover's Lake Esker. This is a, a glacial ridge uh, on the south side of Grover's Lake. And this is the Minnesota state line right up here by these trees. So this is almost on the border in Minnesota. This glacial esker is uh, uh, something that resulted from the, the uh, recession of the glaciers during the Wisconsin, Wisconsinian ep, uh, epoch about uh, uh, 11, 12,000 years ago when it finally uh, retreated from Iowa. As the glaciers melted, they actually formed under ice riverbeds. And as the glaciers finally melted, those under ice riverbeds would fill up with washed in gravel, rocks, and sand. And that's what this particular esker is. You can see all the rocks on it. Uh, you dig down in it, it's gravel and sand. So it's very, very dry. And there are some short grass species of plants on the top of it. So we will occasionally find some short grass species there. Now, anywhere in Iowa, not just in short grass, but a lot of areas, you will find horned larks. Uh, they nest here in the summer. Uh, they also spend the winter here, and I'm sure most of you are from most familiar with seeing them because you'll see large flocks of them on gravel roads out in farm country during the winter. Uh, but they prefer to nest in short grass areas, uh, in pastures uh, with some grass uh, in them that aren't just uh, uh, grazed down like a golf course or something. Uh, and then they do spend some time in our crop fields, uh, feeding on insects and things. So uh, uh, horned larks are basically a short grass uh, prairie bird, but they do exist all across Iowa. Another one that's a short grass species, uh, so we see a lot more of these out west than we do in a lot of Iowa anymore, and that's the grasshopper sparrow. Uh, this is a sparrow that likes short grass prairies in the western states. Here in Iowa, it tends to find uh, pastures uh, with not that are too mowed down by the cattle that are grazing them. Uh, so if they've got just a few inches of grass and large pasture areas, you'll very often find one of these perched on a fence post or a fence line. And this was actually a photo I took a couple of years ago of a grasshopper sparrow down at the um, uh, White Rock Conservancy down by uh, 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 down in Guthrie County. 
Uh, burrowing owls, of course, are a real fan of short grass areas, short grass prairies in particular. And of course, if you go out west, you can find them around prairie dog towns and short grass prairies. Historically, they existed in western Iowa, especially the northwestern corner of the state on dry areas on hills uh, where there were shorter grasses. Um, and uh, this is a photo I took out on the, uh, at quite some distance out on the per Pawnee Prairie grasslands four years ago. But when I lived up in northwest Iowa until 2001, when I moved to central Iowa, uh, we lived in Larchwood, which is the last little tiny town in the very northwest corner of the state. It's sort of a bedroom community for Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Uh, but the last two years I was up there, we had burrowing owls in the roadside ditches just two or three miles outside of town where we lived. And then back in the 1980s, early 1980s, when I was doing a pheasant survey for DNR, uh, one morning in early August down near Sioux Center on the south side of Sioux Center, Iowa, Iowa with my old uh, film camera, that's why this looks kind of uh, grainy and old, I took this picture of one of a family of burrowing owls that were living on a short grass mowed area on the south edge of Sioux Center where they were getting ready to build a housing development. This one's actually perched on one of those little electric pedestals that you see around housing developments. Uh, and just a couple of years ago, one was found in Humboldt County that a lot of people went up to see. So this is a bird that historically existed in short grass areas in Iowa. And then during the winter, we get a short grass resident from up north and actually a sort of a subarctic resident, the Lapland longspurs, which prefer short grass areas and open grasslands, open crop fields uh, during the winter. They're really an open country, short vegetation bird. And I'm sure most of you are uh, uh, familiar with seeing these, especially in the northern half of Iowa during winter months when you're out driving on county gravel roads. Now we'll move to mixed grass prairies or mid grass prairies and, and visit the birds that like or prefer those. This uh, photo is Kaler Prairie up in Dickinson County, another area that I managed uh, for about 28 years up there. It's actually a variety of prairie. It's higher uh, ridges are glacial and rocky, so they will have short to mid grass prairie uh, or mixed grasses, uh, tall grasses and short grasses. And then down the lower, area, lower areas, uh, there were former wetlands and things or wet areas, so they tend to have tall grass prairies down there. But we do find this as a pretty good example of what a mid grass prairie would really uh, support the most of here in Iowa and elsewhere. Uh, bobolinks really prefer mixed grass prairies. Uh, they use high gra tall grass prairies, of course, but they like to have mixed grass prairies, mid, mid height, with maybe a few taller clumps of vegetation uh, perched up or that they can perch up upon uh, once in a while when they're overseeing their territories. And then upland sandpipers are also a bird that really prefers mixed grass prairies. They're also found in short grass and tall grass prairie areas, but their preference is mixed grass prairies. Uh, this is a photo I took years ago up in Lyon County of one perched on a post in kind of a mixed grass prairie area near the Big Sioux River. And this is a photo of a, of a nest of upland sandpiper eggs that uh, Bruce Ayersman, uh, who was a retired avian ecologist from Iowa DNR, that he and I found at Calso Prairie over in West Central Iowa. Greater prairie chickens are big fans of mixed grass prairies. They also like to have a little bit of cropland along around. In fact, they actually increased in Iowa when Iowa begun to be, began to be farmed. But today they're only found uh, down in Southern Iowa, primarily in Ringgold County and a couple of adjacent counties uh, where the last of the population existed in Iowa and DNR has been doing some restoration there over the past about uh, 25 years. Uh, this is a close up from photographer Roger Hill. He's a famous photographer, did a lot of things for DNR photos over the year. And this is one of my pictures of a, from a couple of years ago of the prairie chickens on the uh, on the dancing ground or the booming ground down there. And this is at, uh, again, it's in Ringgold County. This is the Kellerton grassland area, which is also a, a globally important bird area uh, named by National Audubon and by- uh, Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. I can see you on the chat. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. 
I can see you, Mark. No, I can't see you, but I see a few other people. Dad, Dad. Hey, Dad. I hear you. You have to turn off your audio. You're on the... Okay, I'll, I'll go ahead here. Uh, this was named as a globally important bird area uh, by National Audubon and by BirdLife International of Great Britain. Uh, it's one of about 2,000 named uh, globally important bird areas all over the earth, uh, primarily for some of the very rare birds that are down there, especially uh, uh, Henslow sparrows, but also the greater prairie chicken because it's sort of the umbrella species that protects a lot of the rare birds down there. Uh, short-eared owl is another short grass uh, species. Um, it nests up in, uh, uh, from Minnesota and the Dakotas on into Canada. Uh, historically, at the time of settlement, it actually is believed to have probably nested in northern Iowa a little bit uh, in short grass areas. And actually, I remember seeing one in the 1980s in midsummer flying over one of our prairies in Dickinson County. Now, whether that was just an accidental vagrant into the area, or if it might have been trying to nest there, we don't know. And now we'll go to tall grass prairies. This is actually a scene of a restored tall grass prairie at Spring Run Wildlife Management Area in Dickinson County near Spirit Lake, the to the east of East Okoboji Lake. This is about, uh, that's a very big area, by the way. Uh, Spring Run is about 4,500 acres in total size. This is about a 300 acre prairie that was restored back in about 2005. Uh, by the uh, biologist who took over after I had uh, moved to central Iowa. And this has really been a good place to turn up a lot of birds, even some birds that are more common in prairies in southern Iowa than they are in northern Iowa. Uh, Henslow sparrow is a, uh, a prairie species that really prefers tall grass prairies or other tall grass lands, tall grasslands of some sort, but especially prairies. And it really prefers to be in prairies that haven't been burned or mowed or grazed for at least two to three years. So that it has a lot of residual vegetation at the base of the plants and uh, that's where it nests. And then it likes to perch up and sing to attract its mates uh, from the top of those tall grass stems. Sedge wrens are kind of similar. They're very common around uh, in tall grass prairies, especially tall grass prairies that surround wetland areas. Uh, this one I took, uh, this photo I took earlier this summer at Harrier Marsh Wildlife uh, Management Area, which is just across Highway 30 from where I live uh, in Ogden. And then Northern Harriers, um, a kind of hawk that is a prairie nester. And it nests on the ground. Uh, prefers tall grass prairies. It will nest in mid grass prairies, but not short grass areas. Uh, it does still nest on rare occasions in southern Iowa, down in the Ringgold area, and up in the Iowa Great Lakes area on some of the big prairie area preserves up there and wildlife areas. Now we're going to move away from pure prairie to what begins to turn into other types of habitat. So here we've got some brushy prairie or, or early successional prairie where you see the woodlands beginning to move in, uh, in an area that hasn't been burned or mowed or grazed for a number of years and there's woodlands nearby so the seed is starting to spread out. And that uh, provides some special habitat for some sort of uh, edge or prairie edge grassland species, things like the northern bobwhite quail. Uh, which is uh, still exists in decent numbers in southern Iowa, although overall in the United States it's declined about 85% over the past 20 or 30 years. Um, but uh, it, it actually, I think, has been on increase in Iowa over the past two or three years. Uh, a year or so ago, we even had one right here on the edge of town in Ogden, here right on Highway 30 in the middle of the state. And I had some down by the Iowa Arboretum earlier this summer too. So uh, in a, in a uh, brushy, kind of a brushy area, prairie area at the edge of some forest near the Arboretum. Loggerhead shrikes are another bird that likes this type of habitat. They prefer to hunt in the more open prairie grass areas, but they like to perch on the tops of brush or shrubs or fence lines along the prairie. And of course, you know that uh, these are a predatory songbird. And so they will prey on mice and grasshoppers in the prairie, uh, frogs, salamanders, things like that. 
uh, they will uh, uh, put them on a spike on some sort of a plant like a, a wild plum or the, a barb on a barbed wire. They'll uh, pin them to those so that they can tear them apart and eat them. And I've actually seen an adult uh, loggerhead shrike carrying an adult male bluebird that it caught over on a prairie on the Big Sioux River about 25 years ago. And field sparrows, which you're probably all familiar with, of course, really like to hang out around the edge of woods in grasslands right around, around the edge of woods or in some of the brush that extends out into the prairie a little bit. And then I think this is the last one for this group, uh, Bell's Vireo, uh, which do like grassland areas, but they like to have clumps of shrubs in those grasslands. And that's where they tend to hang out for their nesting is in those uh, clumps of shrubs that are kind of separated from the, for from the nearby forests a little bit. Well, now we'll switch to Savannah where we're starting to see trees grow out into prairies. And uh, this is a photo down at the uh, White Rock Conservancy in Guthrie County, which has a lot of savanna down there that they've been restoring. And the savanna has some unusual birds. These aren't really called grassland birds, but yet they live, they need the combination of grasslands and the trees that, uh, that are scattered making a savanna. So barn owls will hunt those open grasslands, but they will perch in trees, even nest in a hollow one occasionally, although they actually prefer to nest in old uh, 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 vacated barn buildings, uh, one of the best places to find them. And of course, there are a lot of nest boxes being put up for them the last few years around Iowa, and their numbers are starting to increase in Iowa, again, especially around savanna areas. Lark sparrows are sort of considered a savanna species, a more western species in Iowa. It does cover most of the state, but the further west you go, the more of these we will see. They like to hang out in grassy areas with scattered trees, even along the side of roadsides where there are some uh, trees along field edges and then some nice gravel roads. And very often you'll see them down on the gravel roads coming out of those trees onto the gravel roads. Uh, and uh, here in Central Ion, west of me, I see quite a lot of these. And uh, I think they're really one of the most beautiful sparrows there is because of that face pattern. And then orchard orioles. Well, a lot of people would think that, well, this is strictly a forest bird. Well, it's not. It is an open forest bird or a, a savanna bird is what it prefers or orchards. That is, you know, apple orchards scattered widely over grassland areas, a great place to find an orchard oriole. And that's where it gets that kind of a name. So while it's not a grassland bird and it nests in trees, it still prefers those savanna type areas for its pr primary habitat. And then red-headed woodpeckers, which almost everybody would think of as a forest bird, but yet they prefer savannas over anything else. And if you have an oak savanna, you will find more red-headed woodpeckers in that sort of habitat than almost any place else in Iowa, except where there are large numbers of dead trees. And that is uh, the, the loss of uh, ash trees in the last few years to, uh, green, to the green ash borer is really causing apparently an increase in the red-headed woodpecker population in Iowa. So now let's just talk about one thing that's not natural, but uh, that is something that was invented here in Iowa uh, back in about 2007, I think is when it was started, when uh, some researchers at Iowa State University and with NRCS uh, began developing this idea of prairie strips. And that is planting strips of prairie grasses through fields uh, primarily to prevent uh, erosion, uh, uh, water loss, uh, uh, pesticides, and, and uh, chemical contamination of the water that flows off the fields into our streams and lakes. And one of the primary researchers that started this project was Dr. Lisa Schulte Moore from Iowa State University, who I have met and, and visited with a number of times. And my son, who's a wildlife biologist with Iowa DNR, has worked with her extensively uh, in Southern Iowa in the Grand River Grasslands, the Ringgold County, uh, Kellerton Prairie area. But they came up with this idea of prairie strips and started testing it and found out that it really did a lot to protect our water resources in Iowa by stopping the, the runoff from some of these fields. The other thing it did is start providing habitat for a lot of birds that really like this type of habitat. Now, dick sissels, of course, very, very common grassland bird in Iowa, even around the edge of crop fields and roadside ditches, we see them all the time. But 
uh, these grassless strips have, have seemed to become uh, particularly attractive to dick thistles, and we always find lots of them on these prairie grassland strips in the crop fields these days. Another one that really likes uh, those strips, prairie strips, is the savanna sparrow. Now, just to clear something up, if you're not aware of it, you'll notice that savanna here is spelled differently than the savanna type grasslands I showed you earlier. That's because this is not named after savanna habitat, but rather because it was discovered at Savannah, Georgia back in the early 1800s. And so it got the name savanna spelled with an H. Uh, so it doesn't mean it's in savannas, although it may be seen around Iowa savanna grasslands as well. Uh, so uh, ISU's avian ecology uh, project that's in progress on this has found that uh, grassland birds are about 71 more abundant in fields with prairie strips than it is in a conventional field, even in a conventional field with those that have just unconventional grass buffers, uh, you know, roadside ditches or, or just uh, uh, brome grass buffers along ditches. So there's, uh, you know, almost double the number of birds that can be seen in fields with these prairie strips than there can just in plain fields. And one of those birds that also really likes this is that Vesper Sparrow that I started out the program with. Uh, they will be found in very large numbers in these prairie strips. And then another recent uh, University of Minnesota uh, and uh, Nature Conservancy project has been studying grassland bird to uh, the response of uh, converting agriculture to grasslands up in Minnesota. And that's uh, a real important cons conservation strategy uh, for our water quality and for our wildlife and everything. And what they have found is, of course, that birds like killed deer and uh, common yellow throats are increasing in breeding numbers uh, in grasslands uh, that have been restored in Minnesota. And they are also finding more migrating sparrows, such as this uh, Leconte sparrow in the fall and spring when they're on migration, are showing up in these uh, uh, re, uh, restored or replanted grasslands. So just to kind of wrap up here the show uh, tonight a little bit, we're going to talk about now restoring these prairies. Uh, recreating prairies on former croplands is really important for our birds. And the site should be planted with locally or regionally grown native seed. Now this particular area here is a prairie resource center that's located at the Brushy Creek uh, Recreation Area south of Fort Dodge in Webster County. And this is where they grow northern Iowa prairie plants and then take them across to uh, state, federal, and county wildlife areas across northern Iowa to restore prairies uh, with uh, cedars like they're doing in this particular photo. And what they're really trying to do up there is provide as huge a diversity of plants as they can uh, for restoring our prairies. And of course, this is very important for bird diversity as well. I think when that first project was first started up there in, uh, oh, I believe they started that in about 2008, uh, they had 20 or 30 prairie species that they grew up there. And I think they grow well over 100 prairie species at the Prairie Resource Center up there now. Patch burn uh, and rotational grazing of prairies is really good for creating a, a variety or a mixture of habitats and the density of the grasslands that can be preferred by a bigger variety of grassland birds. So what DNR and the Fish and Wildlife Service and County Conservation Boards, Nature Conservancy, Iowa Natural Heritage Foundation, other organizations are doing now is burning portions of prairies and grasslands, but leaving other portions unburned. And then sometimes they're turning cattle out into those and the cattle will go to those green areas that have been burned and graze on those. And there will be some short grass prairie birds that nest there, but then they leave the taller mid, mid grass and tall grass prairies pretty much undisturbed, allowing a lot more habitat for them. So it really does create a bigger diversity of birds. And one of the neat things that I found on the internet here I think after I did this program originally, I, I added this phrase that I, I read in a report somewhere that somebody said, what's good for the birds is good for the herds. And just to uh, kind of relate to that a little bit, uh, in the last few years, I started up in North Dakota, the National Audubon Society is now working to create bird-friendly ranching. 
Uh, that's uh, conservation-based grazing that protects grassland bird habitats and offers a much more valuable meat market for, for ranchers. And this is going to be spread across the Western United States, well, everywhere that's, that's prairie, really. So you'll see the plan for National Audubon is actually to try to expand this into Iowa. There is one, uh, one uh, project down here on the Iowa-Missouri border. This was all started by, believe it or not, this guy, Marshall Johnson, is the head of the National Audubon Society's Dakota office at Fargo, Minnesota. Uh, and he has been there for close to 20 years. Uh, so just this kind of also relates to the, all the talk later ab uh, recently about uh, black birders, how much it, how importance it is for us to get uh, more of our black Americans into birdings. Well, this guy has been doing it for almost 20 years and really getting a lot of ethnic minorities, Native Americans and everybody up in the Dakotas interested in birding. So what we want to do here is just finish up and say that saving and restoring prairies uh, can save and restore our birds. And Marshall Johnson, that guy who is the vice president for National Audubon and then head of the Dakota's office, he came up with this phrase and said, what uh, you are, what hope looks like to a bird. That is people are what, look, look, or what hope looks like to birds. And there is a new report uh, available from the National Audubon Society. Actually, it came out last fall or winter. Uh, and you can go online and read that. It's a fairly lengthy one, but it's a North American grasslands and bird report and about what we need to do to save the grasslands and save our birds in this country. So that finishes up my program. And I think at this point now, we will turn it over to any questions that anyone might have. And you all can ask Doug with your voices questions just by unmuting yourself. Um, if you want to type them into the chat, I can read them to Doug as well. I have a question. <clears throat> um, when Highway, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, when Highway 20 was established, only <clears throat> four lanes did across Iowa, it was going to be called the um, uh, Highway 20 Parkway. They're going to restore prairie all along the way. I don't know if that ever happened. I see some wildflowers along here. Has that happened and is it important for birds? It is important for birds and I've driven Highway 20. I don't know how much of it is restored to prairie. There are portions of it I know that uh, have been restored to prairie. Uh, and of course, you know, it's actually a much wider right of way than the interstates are in Iowa. And I think that was part of the purpose of it. But I don't know all the details about that. And I don't know if any research has really been done yet on how that may be uh, assisting the birds in that area. Certainly it's probably assisting monarch butterflies and other things if they're planting enough prairie. Thank you. I have a question. Uh, these pollinator fields that have mostly uh, rudbeckia and um, monarda, those kinds of things, are they being used much by grassland birds at all? Well, they certainly are. Uh, not as much as a uh, much larger, uh, more diverse prairie would. But yes, anything that's got the natural uh, plants, natural prairie plants, even if it's only a small number, or a small variety is going to host more birds than a brome field is going to. Yes. Any others? Doug, can you talk about farmers who put land in the CRP or the crop reduction program? Are there prescribed plants that they are supposed to plant and are they more bird friendly than they used to be? Over the years it did change. It became more bird friendly. When CRP first started back in the 1980s, it basically only uh, required um, oh maybe brome grass or just one tall grass prairie species like big blue stem or Indian grass to be planted. And when I first started working with farmers in northwest Iowa, there were many fields that were just all one type of grass, but they certainly did have more birds than those areas did when they were croplands. Uh, but then over the years, the NRCS did revise the whole program 
and began to require bigger diversities of prairies. Uh, they reduced the amount of, uh, or the number of times that it could be mowed uh, for weed control. It, it really, they switched it more to spot weed control and other things. And then now they can actually even restore a prairie by burning it one time during a CRP contract, which then will restore that prairie even better during the second half of that contract. So over the years, yes, CRP has become more and more important. Problem is that over the past few years, uh, our federal government has been reducing uh, the CRP program. Uh, and that has been a casualty here in Iowa. I think we've already lost, uh, ooh, I'm not sure the figure, maybe a million acres of CRP uh, since that started going down. Now we still have a lot of CRP and there are some programs that are still increasing small areas of CRP across the state. Um, um, DNR is working pretty strongly with that. I can't recall exactly what that's called, but yeah, there is, a, while some CRP is going out, some is coming back in too. Thank you. Here's a question that came in from Anne in chat. It says, what plants are in the short grass prairie? Um, we are planting seeds this fall. Okay, uh, short grass prairie, if you go out west or even, even in a few rare places in Iowa, like if you go up to uh, Gitche Manitou State Preserve in the northwest corner of Lyon County, right on the South Dakota border, you'll find buffalo grass growing there in the short grass. Buffalo grass is a very important, uh, a major short grass. And uh, this can be mixed with uh, a variety of uh, shorter wildflowers and things like prairie needle grass, uh, uh, little blue stem, there's, there's really a lot of short grass prairie uh, plants. Uh, buffalo grass is actually something that you can let grow in a yard. I've seen people grow it in their yard and it only grows to about three or four inches high and then quits and you really don't have to hardly even mow it <laughs> more than maybe once or twice a year if you want to do that. And I'm sure that hosts birds right in people's yards too. Any others? Do you? Doug, uh, uh, this is Tom. Go ahead. Question. Um, so how important are, is your mix with forbs and grasses for uh, insects and things for birds? So if you're it, planning- it certainly, Yeah, it certainly is important because uh, those forbs are going to in, uh, increase the variety of uh, numbers of insects. And that's gonna be very important to birds because certain birds like to feed on different kinds of insects. And if they can find a good variety produced by uh, a, a nice diverse prairie that will help increase the bird populations there. So I grew up on a farm and ranch out in Wyoming. And I mean, parents you know, would go out and cut hay. How does that, you know, cutting of hay, obviously there's going to be some birds that were nesting. What's right. the level of loss for grassland birds just because of that? Yeah, that, that's really important. And over the years, you know, hay cutting has gotten to be more frequent uh, throughout a year. Now this year, the big drought in Iowa, probably not so much, but uh, I can remember growing up in Minnesota when farmers around where I lived only cut hay maybe twice a, twice a summer. Uh, by the time I lived in Northwest Iowa, they were harvesting it three times a summer. And in recent years, they harvested up to four times a summer. Well, that's pretty, when they're doing it that frequently, it's pretty well wiping out the, a lot of birds that nest there. Um, the best thing to do, if it's possible, is to withhold any uh, hay harvest until after the 15th of July, because about 80% of our birds will have nested, grassland birds will have nested by mid-July. And if anybody can wait till the 1st of August, which nobody would probably like to do, but that probably will protect 90% of the grassland nesting birds. Only things like uh, maybe some grasshoppers and gra or, uh, some sparrows of some sort, and perhaps some goldfinches or something. Well, they're more of a brush nester anyway. Uh, but, uh, you know, it'd be very few birds that are affected when, when hay is mowed later in the summer. Um, if you're mowing uh, in, the, 
in the early part of the summer, one thing that DNR recommends doing, if it's possible, and some farmers are great conservationists and will do this, uh, if they see a bird leap out of the grass, uh, they should probably try to avoid mowing that particular spot because it may be nesting right there. Pheasants, of course, are the most obvious things that are going to do that. They're easily seen, but uh, also some of the ground nesting songbirds uh, uh, in June and July, when they pop up uh, during a hay mowing, they're probably nesting somewhere right there. And if the farmer can maybe swing around and miss a little bit of an area there, maybe he will protect a, a nesting site. If uh, anybody else wants to talk to somebody else that's on, on, the, on the call here, uh, they are welcome to do it uh, now if there's no more questions for, for Doug. I have one related to what he was just talking about. Um, how do you approach a farmer and maybe ask him not to mow till later? Uh, we, <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, we have a neighbor that has a hay field. Uh, we live in the woods, but it's just next to our woods and there are always bobolinks there. So apparently they've had some success. But I know this year that he mowed before they were finished nesting. So um, what's a good way to approach somebody and ask them maybe to um, delay their hay harvest? That, that can be difficult. I can tell you that after working for 29 years in Northwest Iowa, both on public lands and working with private landowners, it's not easy to do that. Uh, what I like to do is ask a farmer how, how interested they are in birds and uh, ask them if they realize that a lot of grassland birds are disappearing and, you know, and if a farmer can really take a little bit of caution, they can help uh, save our continent's birds. Uh, bobolinks, for example, are fairly, I mean, they get here late in the spring. They're kind of a late one to show up, but then they nest right away. And usually by early to mid-July, most bobolinks are done nesting. Right, right. Maybe some late ones. So if, uh, you know, if it's possible to just suggest something like that uh, to a farmer that, you know, those beautiful bobolinks that are in huge decline across the country, um, you know, if they can uh, possibly delay mowing or if they flush a bobolink, try to mow around that area or any other birds that they see too. It's not easy. Um, what I found in Northern Iowa is that maybe 10% of the farmers I dealt with though were pretty fond of nature and they were willing to talk about that and try to do some things to help. So sometimes you can find some people that are willing to do that. Okay. Doug, <laughs> Doug is there any, is there any uh, governmental, how do I say it, incentives that a farmer can apply to or do something for that first cutting so they, they wait or not? Uh, there wasn't when I was working in the field. Now, since I've retired, I don't know if there's anything. I don't think there is. Okay. But it's possible there could be something, maybe in particular states, offered in particular states. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Well, if we don't have any other questions, or comments, we'll watch um, uh, Doug's interesting video from the South Dakota for a minute or so, and I'll have some closing comments. And if you think of anything else at the end, it'll be good. Here it is. Okay, I'll go ahead. This is just a little over a minute long. Uh, just tell you quickly that I did a birding trip out across all of South Dakota a week or two weeks ago. Uh, was birding in 101 or 102 degree temperatures, wasn't getting a lot. <laughs> but when I got out into the Black Hills, I was able to find some things uh, that I haven't seen for a while. I went up to Rough, Rough, Lock Hall, Rough Lock Falls in the Northern Black Hills in Spearfish Canyon, where over the years I've seen American dippers many times. But I've never had good camera equipment out there with me before. So this year I took some, I, I managed to find a dipper at Rough Lock Falls feeding in the water and I took close to 90 photographs of it and also shot some short videos with my big telephoto. Now, I'm gonna show this. This is a little bit of three different short videos that I pasted together and a couple of them are 
a little out of focus and a little bit jiggly. And that's just because it was so hard to get focused on that bird with this big camera and hold it steady. So you'll see after I point out where it is first uh, at a distance, then you'll see it close up. And at first it's a little out of focus, but then, then the shots will focus and you can see it feeding a little better. So we'll go ahead and start this. So the first part of this video is just kind of scanning Rough Lock Falls, which is not a real big waterfall, but it's kind of a series of uh, small waterfalls in Spearfish Canyon and a side canyon. And as we look over here on the left side, right here, if you can see the arrow, here's the dipper uh, in the water right here by these rocks. And he's gonna come down here, he or she, whichever it is, is gonna come down onto these lower rocks here in a minute. And it, when it did, that's when I put my big telephoto on it and started shooting some close-ups of it feeding in the water. Now, I've got to tell you that uh, I'm not a uh, professional video photographer, so that is not a very professional film, but I was just really excited about being able to uh, actually get video, not just some great photos, which I got some really great photos, but even some decent uh, enough videos that you can actually watch one of these little water birds. Oh, you know, the only, not the only species of songbird we have that literally lives in the water and feeds in the water. And if you ever want to see one of these and haven't seen it before, the, one of the absolute surest places to be able to see it is in the Black Hills up at Rough Lock Falls in Spearfish Canyon, just a few miles south of the town of Spearfish. And uh, they, I have seen them nesting under the falls a number of years ago when I didn't have cameras with me. Uh, and I've been back to see them a few times since. Uh, about five or six years ago, I think was the last time I was there. At this time I had all my camera equipment and I was really aiming at getting pictures and videos of them this time. So anyway, just uh, Tom thought uh, you folks might like to see that. So I said, yeah, I'd be willing to share that with you tonight too. So. Oh, that would be a target bird if you go out in a fast stream out west. It's so much fun to watch, bouncing and going completely underwater all times of year for, for insects. And Doug, we want to thank you so much for your expertise and a very fine program, and especially for all you do for birds for, for Iowa and, and for Audubon. We'll look forward to having you back again sometime. For, for the rest of you, um, thank you for joining us on this new venture for us.